All right, the first thing I want to do is give a big hand to Ramona T., Jim Fontana in particular, all the red shirts who do such a wonderful job here. And I want to thank Oren Day and Don Kirkwood for providing the main stage for our use. <laughs> month after month, Ramona T. puts together a stellar program to educate, stimulate, and activate good people in ways that will protect our precious freedoms. If you, have, if you have the habit of coming and attending these monthly meetings, you will be supercharged and you'll be educated. Learning more about the wonderment of this special place called America will reinforce our gratitude. And if we bring young people to these events, it will educate them about liberty and liberty, limited government, thus working to support the thesis that that which we, which we do not appreciate, we will surely lose. Education leads to knowledge, which generates gratitude, which in turn motivates us to defend and preserve our precious freedom. On the chance that there's anyone here in attendance who wants to make a scene or disturb, we have five NFL linebackers who will swiftly remove you. Six. Six, I'm sorry. It is my distinct pleasure and profound honor to have a chance to introduce Brigitte Gabrielle. She is a leading expert on global Islamic terrorism, one of the nation's most sought after speakers. She has addressed the Australian Prime Minister, the United States Congress, the Pentagon, the FBI. I'm sure you've seen her on Fox, on CNN, and maybe a few of you on MSNBC, and a whole variety <laughs> a whole variety of radio stations all over the country. But I want to tell you about my personal knowledge and experience with Brigitte and Act for America. A little over three years ago, I was in a book club that chose to read a book called Because They Hate by a woman I didn't know named Brigitte Gabrielle. It tells the story of Brigitte growing up under the onslaught of Palestinian terror. Her injuries, her years in hiding, dodging bullets and bombs, and then making her way to America, it is both fascinating and compelling. It, voted, it, it motivated me to start a chapter of Act for America here in San Diego. It is the perfect book to recommend to people new to the cause who might not be ready for all the complexities of the threats and the geopolitical nature of Islam. Like the movie Stoning of the Sharia M, it is a real story about the plight of one woman and it can, it, it can ignite a more pressing interest in the subject matter. I know it works. My daughter read it when she was in high school and gave a book report, and it opened a whole new world for her. Brigitte's sacrifices inspired me, and now more than 20, 220,000 others who have joined ACT for America. Her team of Guy Rogers, Kelly Cook, Lisa Perenio are a reflection of Brigitte's expertise and dedication. Whatever efforts we make to support and preserving our precious freedom dwarfs next to what Brigitte and her team are doing. I had the good fortune to spend an evening with Brigitte and some of her friends several months ago. Her depth of knowledge, her commitment, her sacrifices, and her warmth were very real. She literally has put her life on the line for the country she loves. Having seen her home in Lebanon fall to terrorism, she works tirelessly to prevent the same outcome in her new adopted homeland. And may I say, in America, we are blessed to have an immigrant like Brigitte Gabrielle as a fellow American. <laughs> Ramona T's primary goal is to act to protect freedom. That noble goal is exactly the goal of Act for America. How do we secure our precious rights? We educate and we stimulate the grassroots and do likewise with our elected officials. In a short few years, that is exactly what Act for America has done under the leadership of Brigitte Gabrielle. I mentioned the 220 membership and growing, but there is also an impact on Capitol Hill. In June, 
at the National Conference, the ACT National Conference, we were treated to a procession of congressmen and congresswomen who addressed us. Brigitte has had a tremendous effect and impact on lawmakers. One after another, they spoke with knowledge and passion about the threats of radical Islam, violent and stealth. In large measure, that is a result of ACT's efforts, Bridget's engaging personality mixed with an unmatched knowledge of the subject matter. Brigitte has formed a bond with the people whose primary constitutional responsibility is our national defense. That's priceless. So both at the grassroots level and at the elective leadership level, Act for America is making a gigantic difference. With your help, more citizens will come on board and more elected officials will understand what they need to do to secure our liberty. I know of no other organization, blog, individual, or think tank that has been as effective in informing and activating a constituency to win the great battle of the 21st century. I am truly amazed at how much she has done in such a short time. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Brigitte Gabrielle. Thank you for being here. I'm sure whoever invented this podium was a man, and he was a tall man. They didn't realize I'm five feet tall. Now, I want you to know that I used to be, don't let my size fool you. I may be five feet tall, but I've got a voice that's a six foot seven. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna try to walk around so everybody can see me from all directions. By the way, thank you for the gorgeous weather. I'm delighted to be here. I cannot believe I, I left the humidity of the East Coast and came to California. Um, and thank you for the warm welcome. It is truly a, a pleasure to be here with you tonight. You know, when I travel the country, people ask me all the time, Brigitte, don't you get depressed talking about such a heavy duty subject? And you know, radical Islam and terrorism. And I tell them, of course I do from time to time. But you know what keeps my spirit up? It's when I travel the nation and I meet amazing, wonderful patriots like yourselves who surround me. You are the ones that give me the energy. You are the hope for America. As long as I travel and I meet people like you filling up auditoriums like this, I know that America is alive and well. And we're going to take our country back. So you are the ones that inspire me. And thank you for taking the time tonight and coming here to listening um, uh, me talk about a subject that's very important to all of us, and that is the issue of national security. Now, a lot of people think, oh, we are in this trouble because of, you know, George Bush went into the Middle East and because of our foreign policy, that's why they hate us. What people don't realize is right now we are witnessing a movement worldwide called Islamofascism rising, and it is worse than Nazism ever was because right now the radical Islamists are acquiring nuclear weapons, and this is something that the Nazis did not have. So right now we have nuclear bombs on the, on, on the black market, dirty bombs on the black market, and the Islamists have the money to buy them. And as I'm speaking to you right now, there are 44 conflicts around the world happening today between Muslims and non-Muslims, regardless where these non-Muslims live, or what religion they have, or what language they speak, or what passport they hold. 44 conflicts. So while we in America think about only what affects us personally, like what's happening in Afghanistan, what's happening in Iraq, uh, what's happening in Libya, and now Syria, because they directly impact you know, oil prices or what's happening in America, most Americans are not paying attention to all the other conflicts happening around the world uh, with, with radical Islamists. Most people don't know what happened in Djibouti last week. How many of you heard what happened in Chad three days ago? 
Nobody. How many, do you know that in India, in Assam, India last week, 35 people were massacred and 170,000 people became displaced by radical Islamists? You didn't hear that on the news. Why? It doesn't affect us. It, it, it's, it's irrelevant to us. So we are truly fighting a movement worldwide rising to attack Western civilization. And people think, oh, they hate us just because we went into the Middle East. Well, the reality is that radical Islam has been attacking America since 1979, regardless whether we had a Democratic or a Republican uh, president in the White House. America has been attacked since 1979 under different presidents. America was attacked in the first time in 1979 under the Carter administration, a Democrat with the hostages in Iran. America was attacked again under the Ronald Reagan administration, a Republican with the blowing up of the Marines in Lebanon in 1983. America was attacked again under George Bush senior administration. America was attacked again under the uh, Clinton administration. It was actually under Clinton administration, a Democrat, that the World Trade Center was attacked the first time. The only difference is the buildings did not come down. It was also under President Clinton that the Taliban trained 10,000 Al Qaeda members in Afghanistan. These people were not being trained for entertainment. They were being trained to attack the United States of America. At that time, George Bush Jr. and Dick Cheney were not even a blurb on the political American landscape. And of course, they attacked us again in 2001 under President Bush. And the, everybody started asking the same question. Why do they hate us? What did we do to offend the Islamic world? And all the psychoanalysts and the psychobabble that we heard on the news the next day, oh, they hate us because we are in the Middle East. They hate us because of our foreign policy. And everybody thought if we elect President Obama, all our sins are going to be forgiven and everything is going to be fine. Two days after President Obama became president, Al-Qaeda issued a press release saying, we continue our jihad against the United States, regardless of who lives in the White House. And since President Obama became president, we have arrested over the last three years over 75 homegrown terrorists, all Muslims, either born into the Islamic faith or have converted to Islam, trying to kill Americans or perpetrate terrorist attacks against America. That is a problem. That is a major problem. The national security issue is an American issue. It's not a democratic issue. It's not a Republican issue. It's not a libertarian issue. It is an American issue. And this is why we must be informed about who we are fighting. We must be able to have the backbone to identify our enemy and call it by name in order for us to devise a solution and a strategy to defeat our enemy. Now, most of you here, I do not know if most of you here know my background, but I'm gonna share with you five minutes of my background so you'll understand where my passion comes from relating to national security. My 9-11 happened to me in 1975 when the radical Islamist blew up my home, bringing it down, burying me under the rubble wounded as they shouted Allahu Akbar. My only crime was that I was a Christian living in a Christian town. I ended up in a hospital for two and a half months. And as I laid in a hospital bed, hooked up to IVs in both arms, going from one surgery to another, I would ask my parents, why did they do this to us? And my father would tell me, because we are Christians, the Muslims consider us infidels, and they want to kill us. So I learned since I was a 10-year-old little girl that I am wanted dead simply because I was born into the Christian faith and lived in a Christian town. Whether I practiced my religion or not, it was irrelevant in my enemy's eyes. We ended up leaving the hospital and coming back home, but my home was no longer the home I left. I ended up living in a bomb shelter underground with my parents in an eight by 10 room without electricity, without water and very little food. 
to get some food, we would go out of the bomb shelter under the bomb, and we would dig out different dandelions and different vegetation that grew around our bomb shelter because it was the only greenery we had. To get some water, we would crawl to a nearby spring. We would crawl in a ditch trying to avoid snipers' bullets as they were shooting at us just to get a drink of water. And every time before we left our bomb shelter, we would say our last goodbyes because we did not know if we're going to come back alive or dead just to get a drink of water. And I remember my mother having to use her stocking on top of the gallon of water to get all the rocks and all the dirt and all the junk so we can drink the water. And this became our existence. And we sat in that bomb shelter waiting for the world to wake up and come and see what's happening to the Christians in Lebanon. And I remember my father saying, well, America, the great Christian country is going to come and see how the radical Islamists are rising in Lebanon and what they're doing to the Christians. And nobody came. And my father would say, well, Britain is going to come. France is going to come. They're going to see what's happening, what radical Islam is doing to the Christians in Lebanon. And nobody came. Meanwhile, the massacre continues and continued and continued. And we heard what was going to happen to us because we were surrounded by radical Islamists waiting to slaughter us. And we heard stories about what the radicals did in Beirut and in different cities that they would get to Christian cities that they would surround, surround and, and infiltrate. They would walk into a bomb shelter, find a mother and a father hiding with a little baby in a bomb shelter. They would take the mother tie one foot of the baby to the mother and another foot to the father and pull the parents apart, splitting the child in half. They committed monstrosities that were seldom reported in the Western media because all the media was located in West Beirut, the area that Yasser Arafat and the Palestinians and Islamists controlled. Tom Friedman writes about it in his book, From Beirut to Jerusalem, that no reporter in Lebanon at that time would dare get a story out that did not have the approval of Yasser Arafat and the, the, the radical groups, because if you want to keep your job as a journalist in Lebanon, you told the lines. And I remember as years went by, you know, we went into the bomb shelter, we thought, oh, it's a two-week thing, and then, you know, the, the problem is going to be solved. And three years later, we're still living in the bomb shelter. By that time, I'm 13 years old. And I remember one day, our friend stopped by, one of our Christian militia. Because our Christian militias were, were su supporting us and protecting us. And he stopped by and he said to me, Brigitte, we just heard a, ch a lot of chatter on the radio today. And we heard that the Islamists are planning a major attack against our town. And he said, if I don't see you tomorrow, I want to wish you a merciful death. And he gave me a big hug and he left. And I remember at the age of 13 years old, putting on my Sunday best, my Easter dress, because I wanted to look pretty when I'm dead, knowing that when they come to slaughter me, there would be no one to bury me. And I remember my mother combing my long black hair down to my hips and tying a white ribbon in my hair that matched the flowers in my dress as I sobbed, begging her, I don't want to die, I'm only 13 years old. And there was nothing my mother could say to me. And we just sobbed. And I remember sitting in the corner of our bomb shelter and my father opened the Bible and started reading from Psalms. I shall walk into the valley of death and fear no evil, for thou art with me. And my parents said to me, we live the long life, you are an only child. If they come to slaughter us tonight, we'll create a distraction, and you just run towards Israel, and you never look back. You see, we lived on the border with Israel, and we knew of supposedly the two enemies, because at that time Israel was supposed to be the enemy of Lebanon. The Jews, if we went to the Jews and beg for help, the Jews are not going to slaughter us because we had more shared values with them than we had with the Muslims. Thank God I did not have to make that decision that night because that's the night when Israel came in physically into Lebanon and kicked out the radical Islamists and the Palestinians away from our town and set up artillery bases so they can defend our town and protect us. And this is how we went on living for another five years until 1982. 
1982, Israel invaded Lebanon all the way to Beirut, pushing out the radical Islamists, including Yasser Arafat, all the way out to Tunisia and working with the Christians in Lebanon, trying to help them take back their democracy and establish their democracy again. Because at that time, we had 11 Islamic terrorist organizations operating out of Lebanon. We came out of the bomb shelter and back to rebuilding our lives. I ended up moving to Israel in 1982 and becoming a news anchor for world news in the Middle East, covering world events and reporting on world events. And that was in the 80s, from 1984 till 1989. And as I read the news night after night, and this is when we started seeing a rise of Islamic terrorism on different continents. So as I reported on the news night after night on world news, on where the terrorist activity, you know, what's happening, I started realizing that there was a pattern developing. Because no matter where the terrorist activity took place, no matter on what continent or what happened, the name of the perpetrators were always Muslims. Ahmed, Muhammad, Hussein, Ali. The name of the victims were always Westerners, Christians and Jews. Terry Waite, Terry Anderson, Colonel Higgins, the Achille Lauro, the TWA, the Pan Am flights, and I can go on and on. As a matter of fact, in my first book titled Because They Hate, I list pages upon pages all the terrorist attacks that have been perpetrated against America when America pushed the snooze button and went back to sleep because America did not connect the dots. And I started realizing that what I used to think was a regional problem between a majority Muslim Middle East trying to either kill or expel the minority Christians and Jews had become a worldwide problem. But the world was not paying attention. The world was not connecting the dots. The world lacked imagination. And isn't this exactly what the 9-11 Commission report said to us? We lacked imagination. It's not that we did not know that Osama bin Laden and Al-Qaeda want to attack the United States. After all, they have told us repeatedly what they wanted to do. They have, they have told us with their actions what they wanted to do. Al-Qaeda attacked the World Trade Center the first time in 1993. The only difference between the two attacks of 1993 and 2001 are the buildings did not come down. They attacked our, the Kubar Towers in 2005. They attacked our embassies in Kenya and Tanzania in 2007. They attacked the USS Cole. And then they were so confident that America was so asleep that they came back and re-attacked the World Trade Center the second time, this time bringing the buildings down and killing almost 3,000 Americans. It is not that we did not know that we had a determined enemy who wants to attack us, and they did attack us repeatedly. It's just that we buried our head in the sand thinking if we just ignore the problem, that problem will disappear on its own. Nobody wanted to tackle the issue of radical Islam in the Middle East. And of course, when September 11th happened the second time, Everybody started asking, why do they hate us? What did we do to offend the Islamic world? Well, if America was paying attention to the rise of radical Islam since 1979, and prior to that, America would have known that they hate us for a very simple reason. The radical Islamists who are on the march today, driving the Islamic agenda around the world, consider us infidels and they want to kill us. And here we are today still dealing with radical Islam. What people in America did not understand, and this is what you need to understand, is where did all these attacks come from? What organized the radical Islamist movement that is moving worldwide right now? And most of you in this room will probably know the name of the organization that launched it, because you've heard it a lot on television in the last year, especially since the revolution in Egypt. And that is the Muslim Brotherhood Organization. Now, why were we concerned about the Muslim Brotherhood? Because the Muslim Brotherhood is the oldest Islamic terrorist organization in the world, founded in 1928 with 70 offshoot Islamic organizations, including Al-Qaeda and Hamas. Now people ask, 1928? Now for those who say that our foreign policy was the problem, that's why after all they attacked us, right? It's our foreign policy, we're friends with Israel. So for those who say they attacked us because of our foreign policy or because we are in Arab land, if that's the case, 
then why was the Muslim Brotherhood founded in 1928? At that time, Israel didn't even exist. We had such an isolationist policy, we didn't want to have anything to do with these people. We had such an isolationist policy in the United States at that time that even in 1939, Newsweek magazine had on its front cover the country divided 50-50. 50% of Americans want to go to war with Hitler, and 50% of Americans didn't give a care about what happens in Europe, and they wanted to worry about the economy and jobs in the United States. So why was the Muslim Brotherhood founded? The Muslim Brotherhood was founded to bring back the Islamic Caliphate, or the empire, which had ended five years prior in Turkey by President Ataturk. A radical movement in Egypt said, how can Christendom win over Islam? Islam is superior to all other religions. After all, the Islamic empire covered more, most of the earth's surface than the Roman empire did at its peak. The Islamic empire ruled for 1400 years. How could it be defeated and end? That's why the Muslim Brotherhood was launched. The Muslim Brotherhood is the major threat that is mobilizing and moving these terrorist organizations around the world today. So how does that affect us in America? Because the Muslim Brotherhood is now entrenched in the United States. The Muslim Brotherhood wrote a plan in 1982. It's a 100 year plan for radical Islam to infiltrate and dominate the West and establish an Islamic government on earth. In the counterterrorism circles, this plan became known as the project. Now, what makes the project very unique is it gives tactics and proposals as to how to infiltrate the West, how to use buzzwords that resonate with the West that makes Westerners put their arms down, how to use our laws against us, our legal system against us, our judiciary system against us, how to use our freedom of the press against us. They talk about how to get democratically elected Muslims on all levels in the West, including government, NGOs, etc. They talk about how to set up nonprofit organizations and human rights organizations and maintain the appearance of moderation in order to advance radical Islam in the West. They talk about how to set up centers and recreation centers in the inner cities so they can recruit from the weakest link in Western societies. They talk about how to appoint Muslim interns in government and, and political offices in the West so they can have an insider view as to how politics uh, uh, are being done on the highest level. They talk about how Muslims should get on the boards of political parties, Democrats, Republicans, uh, Libertarians, anything in the West in order to get on the board and have a vote to sway the direction of that party. They talk about working with like-minded progressive organizations that share similar goal. And this is why when you see the ACLU, for example, working with CARE, the Council on American Islamic Relations, you look at yourself, you scratch your head and you think to yourself, how could these two people have anything in common? But the ACLU is being used as the useful idiots on the hands of CARE, the Council on American Islamic Relations. Now, the plan for the United States, the Muslim Brotherhood wrote a plan for the United States in 1991. The plan for the United States was presented as evidence in the Holy Land Foundation trial, the largest ever terrorism trial in the history of the United States in Dallas, Texas, where our government handed down 108 guilty verdicts to um, Muslim Americans and radical Islamic organizations in America who were funding terrorism and sending money uh, to the Middle East. I'm standing behind the podium because I need to use notes and therefore, I needed to lay the paper, but I'm gonna have to step over here so you nice people can see me and I can see you. So why are we concerned about them here in America? Here is the plan that they wrote for the destruction of the United States and the infiltration of the United States. This plan was presented as evidence in the largest ever terrorism trial in the history of the United States in Dallas, Texas. Now, this plan says, مذكرة تفسيرية للهدف الاستراتيجي العام للجماعة في أمريكا الشمالية. You understood that, right? 
I just had to show off my Arabic. <laughs> so you can understand that I actually know what I'm reading. I'm not making it up. It's in English and in Arabic, and this is titled An Explanatory Memorandum on the Strategic Goal for the Group in North America, written 5-22-1991. Now, I'm going to give you just a paragraph out of this plan that will give you an idea of the Muslim Brotherhood plan for North America. We have never before faced an enemy who doesn't mince word, who doesn't lie, who doesn't cheat. They tell us exactly what they want to do. We know exactly what they want to do. Not only do they tell us, they issue press releases about it. They make videos about it and mail it to Al Jazeera so Al Jazeera can air it. We know what our enemy wants. Here's what they talk in their plan about what they want to do in America. This is uh, the title of the paragraph is Understanding the Role of the Muslim Brother in North America. And here is how it starts. The process of settlement is a civilization jihadist process with all the word means. The Ikhwan, which is the Arabic word for brothers, must understand that their work in America is a kind of grand jihad in eliminating and destroying the Western civilization from within and sabotaging its miserable house by their hands and the hands of the believers so that it is eliminated and Allah's religion is made victorious over all other religions, end quote. That pretty much tells you exactly what they want to do in America, doesn't it? Yeah. The most important page out of this document is the last page. Because the last page lists 29 front Islamic organizations set up by the Muslim Brotherhood as a front in America to sabotage our miserable house by our hands and destroy our country. I'm going to just mention to you some that I highlighted that I think they'll be of interest to you. Number one on the list is ISNA, Islamic Society of North America. And if some of you are familiar with that, ISNA, is because they are now advisors to President Obama about Middle East policy. We not only have the Fox watching the hen house, we have the Fox inside the hen house talking to the ear of the president. It is actually known that the president of ISNA wrote President Obama's speech, which he delivered in Egypt, his first presidential speech to an Arabic country. ISNA also is now putting pressure on the FBI in uh, purging all verbiage relating to radical Islam, Islamic terrorism, uh, Islamic radicalism, jihadism, jihad, out of their counter-terrorism training manual. And since I'm speaking at a tea party too, I would like you to know that ISNA just called for the banning of all guns last week. That's right. They want you all to put your guns down. So, number two on the list is the MSA, the Muslim Student Association. The Muslim Student Association has more chapters on American college campus than the Democrats and the Republicans combined. Number eight on the list is NATE, the North American Islamic Trust. NATE owns the deed to the majority of mosques in the United States. Number 22 on the list is IAP, Islamic Association for Palestine, which later became CARE, Council on American Islamic Relations. That's the Muslim Brotherhood plan for North America. In their plan, they detail how they want to infiltrate us through our education, through our media, through politics, through think tanks, and every sector of our society that they are able to infiltrate us through. But at this point, I'm going to focus on the education part because so you'll have an idea of how they are shaping the future of America through brainwashing the future generation of America. They started sending money, millions of dollars, to America's top universities, setting up Middle East study departments and political science departments, using their oil wealth to pump those millions into America and appointing Arab professors who are anti-America, anti-Israel to teach our students that America is, is evil, Israel is evil, and the only time we will have peace in the Middle East is when we get rid of Israel in the Middle East. And how are they doing it? They are using a program called the Title VI program. The Title VI program was instituted by our government after World War II 
to teach American students about foreign languages and foreign cultures so they may be an asset to our country, especially those who want to get into the diplomatic field or the CIA and go work for the State Department. So here is the extent of the Saudi peddling and Islamist peddling that have taken place in our college campuses. $20 million was donated to the University of Arkansas to set up a Middle East study department. 22 million to Harvard University, 28.1 million to Georgetown, 5 million to MIT, 1.5 million to Texas A&M, 5 million to Rutgers, 5 million to Columbia. Other recipients to Saudi tainted monies include UC Santa Barbara, John Hopkins University, Duke University, American University, UCLA, Howard University, etc., etc. You get the idea. From the Ivy League to the community colleges, we pump the gas and they pump poison into the hearts and minds of our future generation. And that's why we must become energy independent tomorrow. People ask me all the time, Brigitte, my gosh, why is the media so biased? I mean, my gosh, if you are watching CNN or maybe CNN International, God forbid, if you're stuck on one of those cruise ships and you're the only thing you can watch is CNN International, it's like watching Al Jazeera in English. You know, you know, my husband used to watch TV on the cruise ship with his shoe in his hand, ready to throw it at the TV. You know, America could do no good in their eyes. And I tell people, why are you surprised? Because for the last 16, 20 years, all these students graduating out of our universities have been taught a steady diet of hatred against America, are today the bureau chiefs, the news anchors, the news writers, the news reporters, the policy makers, the foreign policy shapers. And you wonder why we have the bias in the media that we have? Just look at our president. We don't have a commander in chief. We have an apologizer in chief who never misses an opportunity to apologize for America. <laughs> the strategy worked so well on college campus that the Islamists decided, why wait until the kids get to college? Why don't we start teaching them about uh, Islam, their version of Islam, in sixth and seventh grade? This way, by the time they get to college, they are already 18 years old and they vote. So they launched the Islam curriculum. The Islam curriculum began as a three-week course where students have to memorize and recite the Quran verses from the Quran, adopt Islamic names, uh, um, uh, go uh, recite Islamic prayers, uh, go to a mosque on a field trip uh, to experience what it's like to be a Muslim. And you know, when I started speaking about this, when I started traveling nationwide, people would say to me, oh, Brigitte, you are exaggerating. I mean, we have separation of church and state in America, right? How could this be happening? Well, it's interesting that I'm speaking in California <laughs> oh, you know what I'm going with this, right? Okay, so I decided there's nothing like show and tell. Here's the course. See, I got some practice at this, as you can tell. And the irony is this course began in California by a company based in California in 1991. Ten years prior to September 11th. 10 years prior to September 11th in 2001. This is where I wish I have something so I can, hold on, we're gonna do something about this. Okay, now. Because I'm gonna read to you from the course and I want you all to see. Okay, here is the course to give you an idea how asleep we have been and how organized our enemy has been. This course is put a copyrighted in 1991, put out by a company in California called Interaction Publishers, Inc., doing business as Interact, based in Palomar Oaks Way in Carl's Band, Virginia. <laughs> That's right, okay. So, 1991. Here's how the teacher starts the course, just to give you an idea of how this course directs the children. From the beginning, you and your classmates will become Muslims. You will be a member of a caravan. This is how the teacher starts the instruction to the students. Okay, you all, you're Muslims for the next three weeks. 
The teacher continues the instruction with, dressing as a Muslim and trying to be involved will increase your learning and enjoyment. Finally, trying your best at all tasks will guarantee you an excellent grade and a more enjoyable time. The teacher is already dangling the great carrot in front of the students. Here are the list of names the students have to choose from. They have boys' names and girls' names. Abdullah, Khalid, Hassan, Hamza, Ibrahim, Arafat, Yusuf, Anwar, Karima, Maryam, Noor, Amina, Fatima, Samira, etc., etc. And here is a wisdom card that the students have to uh, use to memorize their lesson. You know, it's a cue card. It's like when students are studying math and their multiplication tables and they use cue cards to memorize their lesson. This is the cue card to memorize the Islam lesson. Now I'm choosing this particular card that deals with jihad because jihad has become such a, a, a word that we hear a lot by Islamic terrorists, especially those who want to blow themselves up, fi sabil al-jihad, you know, they want to blow up in the path of jihad. You've got terrorist organizations named Islamic Jihad or al-Mujahideen. Uh, so jihad plays obviously a central law in, uh, uh, role in Islam. Uh, suicide bombers who do their videos before they, they blow themselves up, they recite on their video how they are dying in the path of jihad but here's how our students in public schools are studying this course a jihad is a struggle by Muslims against oppression invasion and injustice this is a fact card now if these words sound familiar to you it's because they are the talking points of al-qaeda Every time you hear Al-Qaeda issue press release about why they're fighting the United States, why do they say they're fighting America? We're fighting injustice. We're fighting invasion. We're fighting occupation. We're fighting oppression of the Islamic world. When you hear suicide bombers, Palestinian suicide bombers, uh, and doing their last video, what are they talking about? Why these poor freedom fighters are blowing themselves up? Because they say they are fighting invasion. They are fighting oppression. They are fighting injustice. So right now, our enemy is teaching their talking points to our sons, unsuspecting students in sixth and seventh grade teaching them their talking points, brainwashing them. So when these students are 18 and 19 years old and 20 years old and 25 years old and they're watching television and they are seeing our soldiers returning back from fighting radical Islam somewhere in God forsaken place and they watch Israeli television and see how Israel is defending itself against suicide bombers, they're going to say, well, of course, you guys deserve to be kicked like this. I mean, after all, if you were not in their land, if, you know, these poor guys are fighting invasion and occupation and, and you guys are invading them, so, you know, you kind of asked for it. Do you see where the brainwashing is happening? Do you see how they're shaping the future minds of our nation? You know, Hitler made a very important statement. He said, give me the children. I will change society in 10 years. And that's exactly what Hitler did. We are seeing the same thing happen today in our public schools, paid for by our tax dollars. This course began in our public schools in 1991. And you wonder why we have a problem in major states like California, in big cities around the country? This started in California. And now this course is taught as a part weaved into the curriculum, into social studies books and history books nationwide while we were asleep. But since we are at a tea party, and I know a lot of you probably here are Christians, I want to share with you this prayer that the students have to analyze in the classroom. It is the Shahada prayer, which is the equivalent to um, the salvation prayer for the Christians. You know, I accept Jesus into my heart as my Lord and Savior. This is when somebody converts to Islam. This is what they recite. The students have to analyze this in public schools. Here's the prayer. Praise be to Allah, Lord of creation the compassionate, the merciful, king of judgment day. You alone we worship and to you alone we pray for help. Did I mention this is public schools? Paid for by our tax dollars? Guide us to the straight path, the path of those whom you have favored, which is the Muslims. Not of those who you have incurred your wrath, which is the Jews, nor of those who have gone astray, which is the Christians and the atheists. 
and I'm going to read you one last quote as a class exercise. As you can see, I'm skipping a lot through the course, but you get an idea of the general direction in this course. Here is a class exercise. Become a Muslim warrior during the Crusades or during an ancient jihad. Explain weapons, tactics, etc. Explain weapons, tactics, etc. That, that's a course for students in public schools? In sixth grade and seventh grade? And now they extended this course all through high school. As a matter of fact, these questions now are put on the SOL testing that the students have to pass in order to get to college. 22 questions on the SOL are a part of this course. Public schools nationwide. And I believe we need to take political correctness and throw it in the garbage where it belongs and start calling a spade a spade. These are the same public schools where we cannot put up a Christmas tree, where we cannot sing Christmas carols, where we cannot say we have a Christmas vacation. It's now winter break and spring break. And yet they are teaching this type of education in our public schools. And don't get me wrong. I, I, I'm an equal opportunity mom. I want my kids to be educated about all religions in the public schools. I want my kids to have an all-rounded education about Christianity, Judaism, Buddhism, Hinduism. But I do not want my children indoctrinated into any religion. Let me teach my kids at home the nitty gritty. You know, I travel the nation all the time. And we in this country are so tolerant, so open-minded. This is what makes America wonderful. If you look around this room, we are a tapestry of color. People who are white, black, Hispanic, brown, yellow, Chinese, Japanese, everything in between. People came to this country from all over the world to be free, to become Americans, to become one in this country to become one a melting pot. I am sick and tired when I hear people say I'm an African American and I'm a Vietnamese American and I'm an Italian American. I am nothing but an American. <laughs> people came from all over the country to be Americans. People couldn't wait here couldn't wait to get here. Some people came on the Mayflower and people like me who came on the TWA. <laughs> we came here because we love what this country has to offer. Every country has its own shortcoming. We're not perfect. Nobody is perfect. No country is perfect. But you know what? By golly, America's God's gift to the universe. This is the best country in the world. <laughs> This is the best country in the world. And I am sick and tired when I hear people putting America down, apologizing for America, hating America, loathing America. For God's sake, if America is so bad, we will give you a one-way ticket to get the hell out to whatever country you want to go back to. It is time to start speaking the truth and throw the sleeves of sensitivity and political correctness in the garbage. It is time to develop the backbone that our founding fathers had, to stand up for this country, to say, you know what, we love this country. I don't care what color you are, I don't care what language you speak, as long as you speak English, because by the way, I believe English is the official language of the United States and shall remain so. We don't care what you speak. We don't care what your background is. We don't care what you cook at home. We don't care what language you speak at home with your grandma and grandpa. Fine. As long as you put this country first and above all. And if anybody's going to call us racists for calling a spade a spade about radical Islam and those who wish to do our country harm, by golly, they will have to argue with me in Arabic, my mother tongue, before they can call me a racist. <laughs> So, I'm not only here to tell you about 
you know, all the problems that we have. I am here to inspire you. I am here to empower you. I am here to mobilize you. I am here to tell you what we are doing to take our country back. When I started speaking after September 11th, and September 11th was a defining moment for me. September 11th was a defining moment to America because every single one of us remembers exactly where we were on that day. We all sobbed together. We all cried together. We all watched those TV screens with the buildings coming down time after time, thinking to ourselves, we felt helpless. We felt brokenhearted. We felt frustrated. We were in disbelief that someone could commit such a crime against innocent people. I, like you, that day was watching television when my two daughters came home from school in the afternoon. And my daughter came in and she was watching with me the TV and she said, mommy, why did they do this to us? And I found myself looking at my 10-year-old child who was around my age when I asked my father that question. And I had to answer my American daughter and tell her the same thing my father told me 30 years prior. They hate us because they consider us infidels and they want to kill us. Here we were, two generations apart, Two continents apart. I was a young Lebanese girl who spoke the Arabic language. She is a young American girl who speaks the American language. 8,000 miles apart, two continents apart. And I found myself repeating to her exactly what my father told me. That was my defining moment. That's the day when I decided I will do everything I can to make sure that my daughter will never have to look at her daughter's eyes or her son's eyes and tell him or her what I told her and what my daddy told me. That was my defining moment. That's the day I became an activist. So I began a mission to educate Americans about the threat of radical Islam, and I started traveling nationwide. And the more I traveled, and the more I spoke to groups from 10 people, Rotary Club was meeting at Pungo's Frankie's Ribs at 7 o'clock in the morning, <laughs> where the average age was 79 with hearing aids, you know, and, and, and bless their hearts, every word I would say, they would say, huh? You know, so this is how I got so good at what I say. You know, I, I got pretty off, quick on my feet with this stuff. Too many repetitions. Uh, and I realized no every time I spoke to groups from 10 people to 10,000 at a time, one question kept popping up. Now that I'm informed, what can I do? Now that I'm educated, give me something to do because I feel frustrated. And I realized very quickly that while education is important, education by itself is not sufficient. Education must be coupled with action. And that's when I launched Act for America. I'm proud to tell you that Act for America today is the largest national security organization in the country with 240,000 members and over 700 chapters nationwide with a full-time lobbyist on Capitol Hill. That's why we're here today talking to you. We are taking the nation and networking the nation together to make a difference because I realized while I would speak in Fontana, California, people would say to me, oh, Brigitte, you don't understand. We in Fontana have a problem with radical uh, Muslims. You know, we're different than the rest of the country. And I would go the next day and I would speak in Pensacola, Florida, and people in Pensacola would say to me, oh, Brigitte, you don't understand. We have a problem in Pensacola. We're different than the rest of the country. And I would go to Charlotte, North Carolina, and I would speak in Charlotte, and I would hear the same thing. And I realized that there was a systematic movement on the part of radical Islamists nationwide that was very organized, while we, the red-blooded patriotic Americans, had no idea what was happening, and we were not organized on the national security issue. And that's what we created with Act for America, a network where we link the country together, where information comes from all over the country, where we can connect the dot and mobilize people nationwide from one nerve center, our headquarters in Pensacola, Florida, where we can mobilize chapter leaders, link them together, network them so they can share tips and tactics and what worked in their community and what they are watching so we can save our country together. And at this point, I'm gonna turn the presentation and introduce you to Act for America's Executive Director, Mr. Guy Rogers. Now, a lot of you who are our members getting our emails have seen Guy's name pop up on the emails. 
It took me two years to find an executive director for Act for America to work as my right hand man. I wanted someone who has the moral clarity and the courage to stand up and be counted and say what needs to be said. It took me two years to find Guy Rogers. Guy Rogers is a political consultant. He's a political strategist, work, worked on five presidential campaigns and over 50 congressional and gubernatorial campaigns in his career. And right now he works with me in leading Act for America. Guy will tell you what we do with Act for America, how you can get involved, will tell you uh, in detail what, uh, how we can work together to make a difference, you as members of the Tea Party and, and members of Act for America as well sitting here in the audience. And after Guy is done, I'm going to come back on stage and do my, my final remarks. Please help me welcome Guy Rogers. Guy Rogers.